Today we turn to the words of Isaiah 49, verse 1 through 6, that speaks of a divine mission that transcends borders and reaches to the ends of the earth. It anticipates a time when God's salvation will extend beyond the boundaries of Israel to embrace the Gentiles, illuminating them with the light of his truth. It points to Galatians 2, verse 1 through 10, where the gospel of Christ is preached and made widely known. Isaiah 49, verse 1 through 6. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. He has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back, to the, bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, uh, Kim, for reading that. And our second reading this morning is Galatians chapter 2. And if you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you to turn uh, with me to Galatians. Uh, There are a few Bibles around the church as well if you don't have one. And if you are new to the Bible, and I'm talking to maybe even maybe if you are 7, 8, 9, if you're that age in church this morning and you're looking for Galatians, uh, it's in the far right-hand side, almost towards the, almost go backwards, the last book of the Bible, uh, boys and girls, and then go, go back a little bit, a few books, uh, towards the beginning, and you'll see uh, it's about there if you're, if you're looking for that. Galatians chapter 2, and uh, starting in verse uh, 1, we'll do verses 1 to 10 and as, we, uh, as we listen to God's word this morning. Uh, Paul says uh, these words to the churches in Galatia. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, uh, whatever, they were, may, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the uncircumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter uh, as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. And they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Uh, All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's pray. Forgive us, Lord, for making this time in our service only about sharing and hearing information. 
by the power of your Spirit, may you open your written word to us that we may be met by the living word, Jesus Christ. And Father, will you, according to your promises, write your word on our hearts that going from here, we may be renewed, comforted, challenged, and changed. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few summers ago, our family was on a road trip on a highway in Quebec, and we were towing a very heavy trailer, a U-Haul, behind our car, and I heard a clunk of metal fall from the front of the engine onto the highway. Clunk, rattle, 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 rattle. And I kind of kept going a little bit, and then I thought, well, I better pull over and just check with that big light. It was kind of loud. And I, I checked, and I looked back, and I saw this circular piece of metal back there, and I went and picked it up on the side of the highway. thought, I better go to the, the latest mechanic. We're in the middle of past Montreal, between Montreal and Quebec City on the way to, uh, on a family road trip. And I go to the mechanic, and I give him this, this piece of metal, and he goes in and looks at our car, and he says, well, I'm very sorry, but uh, it's the uh, alternator. Your alternator's gone. I said, well... How important is that? Is that really important? Uh, he said, bien sûr, bien sûr, it's very important. So uh, he fixed it on the spot, took five or six hours. We had the kids, they were small, they kind of waited there. There's a sub-story to that, which I won't get into. Anyway, then I had to do six, we had to do six or seven hours after they fixed it in the evening to get to our hotel in the middle of New Brunswick somewhere. And so I raced on the highway up and down those hills at the end of Quebec and the New Brunswick border really, really fast in our car with five people towing the... Um, trailer behind and the road trip went fine we got home and about a week after we got home uh, I put the car in drive and it wouldn't go anywhere it wouldn't go anywhere and I took it to another mechanic it was a summer of mechanics um, and uh, he said to me jeepers Greg uh, even towing anything <laughs> and I said well does it you know I said maybe he said like your transmission is gone uh, how much is that well, that's, not, that's a whole other story it was one memory of a summer road trip for our family, which I will never forget. Today's passage in Galatians 2 is kind of like a road trip for the Apostle Paul. He's going to Jerusalem, and when he gets there, what a day the Apostle Paul has in Jerusalem. Remember, Paul has been very interested in taking every opportunity so far in the letter to the Galatian churches to highlight to them the nature of the gospel. And he's very interested in driving this home to them, line after line, verse after verse. And that's where the title Grace Riot comes from, from for this sermon series, uh, Igniting Gospel Transformation. And remember, I said at the beginning of this series that if the gospel, uh, the letter of Galatians was, you know, uh, was a playlist, it would be the loudest kind of music that would be like techno running music, very loud all the time coming at you. If the letter of Galatians was street food, you'd have to compare it to the spiciest Korean street food. And if the letter to the Galatians was a public demonstration, it would be people walking up and down the street with large placards, yelling with all the placards, would be saying, the gospel of grace. And Paul has been so interested in driving different parts of what the gospel is home to the churches in Galatia because there was an issue there that went on for some time about them being led the wrong way about what the gospel is. And we know that in the whole Bible, we hear the gospel from beginning to end. How we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. That he is our redeemer. That God's plan for salvation, the, the consummation of our salvation is seen in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And as we come to this road trip to Jerusalem, Paul is going to lay on to us some more layers of understanding of the importance and clarity and working out of this gospel of grace that Paul is so passionate about defending. And we'll dive into this passage together. We'll look at four sections. 
we'll look at gospel vision, gospel freedom, gospel unity, and gospel living. Gospel vision, gospel freedom, gospel unity, and gospel living. Well, we'll go first to gospel vision. Gospel vision, the first two verses. We see Paul, it says, Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and I took also Titus along. So let's just notice his visit here to Jerusalem. Notice first that it's after 14 years. Paul has been converted on the road to Damascus. He spent three years in Arabia, sort of solidifying this work of Christ in his life and his new calling in his life to go preach to the Gentiles. And now it's after 14 years, perhaps after that, that he now as goes to Jerusalem. He's been working in the northern churches. People have heard about him. We know that from the verses just before. And here, after 14 years, he goes again to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, 14-year break before he goes back to the center of where all of this Christianity began. And let's just notice here, if we can, for a minute, that 14 years is a long time. Uh, 14 years is, is older than some of you are here in church. 14 years is, is, could be longer than some of us have left on this earth. 14 years is a long time. And we see in the Bible over and over again that 14 years, that waiting time, that time where we feel like we're not at the center or not having arrived or not where we kind of think we ought to be, waiting time in the Bible is never wasted time. And we see a biblical principle here that God is at work in Paul over these long 14 years so that God can work through Paul. And part of the Christian life is for you and me to cultivate a willingness to wait on God, a willingness to be changed by God. Part of Christian discipleship is knowing that God is not a God who's hurried. God is not a God who is rushed. God is not a God who who makes mistakes or backs up and goes the wrong way and then goes the other way and goes in circles. Did you know that God is the God who is at work upon your life? Whatever the period of life that you're in right now, the, the job going well, the job not going well, the, the, the housing, the move, the transition, the, or the sense of stagnation or staying put or asking what's the next thing for me, know that we know from the Bible that, that God is always at work upon us. That how we are today is not how we're going to be tomorrow. That the situation I'm in right now will not be like it'll be in two weeks, a month, two years, or even 14 years, that God will have his way in your life in terms of what he wants, how he wants to use you in the world and how he wants to see you shaped according to your thinking and the fruits of the Spirit in your life and the decisions ahead of you. God will have his way in your life. Whether it's now or whether it's at the very end of time when every knee will bow down before him, And it's after 14 years that Paul eventually takes this second road trip to Jerusalem. Now we know that Paul goes five times to Jerusalem. I won't name them for you. Uh, But here is, he says the word again. (laughs) And so it's probably the second time to Jerusalem referred to in Acts chapter 11, or maybe the third time to Jerusalem referred to in Acts chapter 15, because the content is very close to that. But he's on his second or third trip to Jerusalem. And how does Paul get there? Notice this. And we're going to get to the vision part in a minute because he he says why. How does Paul get there? He says he gets there by a revelation. He gets there by a revelation uh, to meet privately. I just want to make a note about this, that as Christians today, we believe that I don't want you to go from here and, and say, you know, God gave me a private revelation, Pastor Greg, to go and do something. None of us today are apostles in the early church. And we see in Hebrews chapter 1 in terms of how God guides, guides that, uh, the, 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 the God now speaks to us, the author says, through a son. And so if you are going through the big questions of life, uh, of God's discernment, where should I go, what job should I take, who should I marry, I want you to remember that as Christians today, we're not guided like the apostles are guided, like a direct revelation from God. 
And if you're wondering where you should go, what job you should take, who you should marry, and just by the way, we, we, we never go to the right place because we're all sinful. We never take the right job. There is no right job because all of us are broken sinners and those we work for are broken sinners as well. And listen, you never, ever, ever marry the right person. Whew. Did I shock you there? I'm not talking to my wife this morning. <laughs> Be careful what I say here. Be careful what I say here. What I'm trying to, what I meant was, no, <laughs> that we all are sinners, broken sinners in need of grace. So get over the idea that I have to find the exact right revelation from God in my life as to jobs where I should go, exactly who I should marry. We're all living as broken sinners and our desire and how we're guided today as Christians is we walk in righteousness by the help and power of God, that God guides, I think, in the Bible and, and for us today more, not where we should go, but what we do when we get there. Our focus as Christians needs to be first and foremost on obedience to Christ rather than on, you know, right down to the minute breakfast cereal guidance. Psalm 84 says this, it says, what good thing has God withheld from those who walk uprightly? Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, what thing will God withhold from those he loves? So our, our role, we're not the Apostle Paul today. I don't go looking for a direct revelation from God. We are guided by the word of God by the principles of the word of God, by the precepts of the word of God, in the freedom that God gives us and the wisdom of those around us. That is a complete sidebar to gospel vision, but I felt I needed to share that. Well, Paul gets at the end of verse 2 to why he's there and this idea of gospel vision. It says at the, in the middle of verse 1 and the end of verse, end of verse 2, it says, I went in response to the revelation. I met with those leaders, that is, all the apostles that were with Jesus at his death and resurrection, and I presented the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles, the gospel I'm preaching outside of Jerusalem to those who are not Jewish, not circumcised. To what? To, to be, is Paul going to get their confirmation? Is Paul going to get their blessing? Is Paul going to, are they going to modify Paul's gospel? Are they going to undermine Paul's gospel? Is, is Paul, does Paul want a pat on the back? No. Paul goes to be sure that he was not running the race in vain. What does that mean? Paul goes to Jerusalem to make sure that the gospel he's preaching is not going to be undermined by the leaders in Jerusalem, that they are not going to stand in his way that there's going to be a fruitfulness enjoyed by the leaders in Jerusalem and by Paul himself. He's going, really, to check out the vision of the leaders in Jerusalem. Paul's going to see what the gospel vision is of the people at the center of the Jerusalem church where everything started. And Paul is asking in his mind, I believe, this basic question, is the vision of those Jerusalem leaders that were with Christ big enough to see the gospel of Christ as more than a reform movement within Judaism, but as the very good news of Christ for the whole world. And that's the basic question that Paul is unpacking, one of the great strands in the early church and in Galatians. Gospel vision, we learn from here, stretches, if we had to say it in a sentence, gospel vision stretches wide. It's not narrow. It's wide. For all cultures, for all people, for all time, for all places, for all people in my life, how is your gospel vision this morning? Other people in your circles, neighbors, friends, co-workers, people in your own families, extended families that you haven't talked to in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, are they in your gospel vision? Does the gospel of Christ apply to them? Are we walking this morning with blinders on, unaware of just how wide the gospel vision is of this crucified and risen Savior 
God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Secondly, gospel freedom. Gospel freedom. Well, we see Paul moves on now to the second point in verse 3. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, can Compelled to be circumcised even though he was a, a, a Greek. So he's getting in now to the freedom. And he says in verse 4, uh, this matter arose, some false believers infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ and to make us slaves. That is not a small topic. That is not a small thing that he's investigating in here. He, he's, 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 he's saying that the problem that he's facing, the thing he's getting into here is that, and this goes on for quite some time in the early churches and in the churches of the Gentiles, and Paul talks about this outside of Galatians as well. There's a problem that Paul is trying to address here around gospel freedom. The very beginning of the of the early churches, and even, to, even now in our time, I'll tell you in a minute, this applies to us. There were people following Paul around, wherever he planted churches, it seemed, who were false teachers. He calls them pseudo-brothers, pseudo-Christians, interlopers, some sham false believers. Really heavy, heavy, heavy language. I mean, remember Galatians, the language in Galatians is so heavy. Why? Because Paul's so passionate about this, and because it's so important. What is it? They were, try, they were spying, Paul says, on our freedom, to, to spy on the freedom. Why? To, to, make us, to make us slaves. To make us slaves. That's, a, that's heavy language. Uh, they, there was people going around feeling it was their role to set other people right. There were people in Paul's churches as, as gatekeepers who were tied up in a way in a very heavy form of Legalism. Now, what can we learn about this? What can we say about this? Um, the, the, there's two kinds of freedoms that were kind of at play here in Paul's churches. The first one was a cultural freedom. And the basic idea around this was that, that the gospel, Paul wants to say, gives a cultural freedom. And Paul argues time and time again, it's like this. If salvation is connected to me obeying a certain set of cultural rules, those rules tend to get very, very specific. And Paul knew all of them because he was a Pharisee. Remember that. And in fact, the, the greater that salvation is tied to a certain culture of any time or any place, in this situation it's tied to Jewish culture versus non-Jewish culture, the, the more that's tied, Paul's saying, what happens is the rules get more and more and more specific, right? And so what you see is you see, well, if I'm a Christian, then I need to follow uh, all of these extra cultural rules to make sure that I come across as separate, as, as kind of pure, and what gets lost is my spirit, my motives, my outlook, my perspective. None of that matters. All that matters is those looking in on you uh, is, is whether you're following those set of expectations that are often uh, unwritten. And it leads, of course, Paul's saying here to something awful, slavery. It leads in our own language maybe to intolerance. That's a very kind of heavy claim. For, for, for us, right? And, and, and we got to check ourselves. Blessings is trying to be, by God's grace, a missional church, which is a church that, that, that puts the, the mission of Christ for the city at the very forefront, the lens through which we, we see everything. And we're passionate mostly about sharing and living the gospel, the eternal gospel of Christ, uh, that, that, that we are, that all are invited into the embrace of the living God through faith in Christ by grace alone. Whether you wear Birkenstocks, I'm not wearing them, but sandals, or leather shoes, or socks, I'm just making this up, or no socks, don't look at your feet right now, or the feet of the person beside you, just kidding. Uh, I'm just saying, that's a very trivial example. But think in our own minds. As we see one another and grow with one another, are there cultural expectations unwritten that we place upon ourselves to say, in the end, that means that, hey, that person is not quite Christian enough. I'm not quite Christian enough. You might say that to yourself. The second kind of freedom that Paul talks about here is how gospel freedom leads to emotional freedom. 
And the kicker here is that if we're living a, 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 a Gentile, Jewish, uh, circumcised, uh, circumcised, uncircumcised kind of Christian life, then what that leads to is emotional slavery. Why? Because if we believe we have to follow a certain set of very specific outward kind of rules in order to be accepted by God and know God's favor and goodness, then we find our lives are on a treadmill of guilt. Our lives are on a treadmill of anxiety, right, that we can never quite get off. Because in the back of your mind and my mind, if you are a slave to, to, to this kind of uh, non-Christianity, God is always a little bit angry at you, you feel. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, ceases. The faithfulness of God that stretches from east to west and north and south doesn't stretch. God is a little bit Old Testament in your own mind, in your old thinking. That's, I won't get into that, but that's just if you know what I mean. When it comes down to it, you think, well, God really is never all that happy with me, and I never really get it right. And if you're living a life of sin, and the Holy Spirit is saying this morning, golly, I hate that, I want out of that so bad, I want to be a new creation in Christ, that's one thing maybe God is calling your heart towards trust in Christ for the first time. I'm talking to you this morning, if you call yourself a Christian and a Christ follower, do you only know half the gospel? That's what Paul's saying. Do you only know the part of the, going back to Revelation, the lion and the lamb? Jesus, the lion, the roaring lion, calling us to rightness, making the world correct. Do you know the lamb? Right? The savior of the world, the redeemer. Uh, do you really have freedom in your own life? Freedom uh, to know, experience, and trust that, that I'm going to, that, that on this side of heaven, my life is not going to be perfect. And the very heart of gospel freedom is this, Paul teaches us, I believe, in Galatians and in these verses. Unless your motives, listen to this, unless your motives in your own spiritual life are grace and gratitude, then you're in slavery. Right? If you see Christianity as anything else than me as a broken sinner responding to the grace of God with thanksgiving, then you're a slave. You a slave this morning? You think you got to add something to the faith and work of God that God has put in your own heart? Do you think that you got to live your whole life to finally measure up to the, the, way, the place God wants you and then you'll finally be at peace, off the treadmill of guilt and anxiety, not feeling all those heavy expectations? It is by grace we are saved through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 Verses 8 and 9, and boys and girls, if you're in your Bible, I would love you to go to the right-hand side and go to one page right to Galatians chapter 2, verses 8, and it says, for it is by grace you have been saved. Not by anything else. Grace, the goodness of God, the unmerited favor of God. You might know this in your mind, friends, but do you ever experience it? Is your language changed because of it? Is your heart full because of it? Does your worldview change because of it? Your thinking. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not from ourselves, it's the gift of God. Are you living in the motivation of grace and gratitude? It's the heart of gospel freedom. Thirdly, we see Paul talk about gospel unity on his great road trip to Jerusalem. Verse 6 starts this whole next section. Gospel unity for those who were held in high esteem, he says, and then on the contrary, verse 7, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel. And verse 8, for God who was at work in Peter was also at work in me. Okay, we're and they give him the right hand of fellowship at the end of this section. Gospel unity. What do we learn here about gospel unity? Basically, what we learn about gospel unity is that gospel unity is not based on cozy feelings. It's not based on mushy thinking. <laughs> the gospel unity is as concrete as that. If you're on one of the hard pews, uh, it's as concrete as that. You can feel it's, it's solid, very concrete. It has a basis. And the basis, Paul says here, is, is the apostles see in him that he's preaching the gospel. 
that truth that's been entrusted to him, that deposit, as the, as the apostles said, that it's based on that objective reality and objective truth of the gospel, which when I look at it and am changed and experienced by, uh, if I experience the gospel and confronted with the gospel, that I myself change, right? That I am transformed by the gospel. That's the basis of the unity, the gospel that Paul preaches. Saved by faith, the righteousness of Christ becoming mine through Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection that we're justified. Uh, We don't self-justify ourselves. We don't make ourselves self-righteous. We're changed by God. And, 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 and the basis of Christianity is understanding that gospel. And also they see the basis of the Christian unity in verse 8 is that the, the, is that the apostles see God at work in Paul. For God who was at work in verse 8. It's like last week when we looked at that phrase, but God. But God did this. The apostles see in Paul's life, for God who was at work. They, 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 they know that God is at work in Paul. They experience and see the fruits of the living God in his life. The, 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 the irresistible grace of God. The a calling of God in Paul's life. And the gospel that he's preaching. This God who's always bringing about his own purposes in your life and in my life. In the world that he's made. The redemption of God being worked out from Genesis all the way through to the end of the Bible, Revelation. The apostles see this God who is at work. That's the basis of gospel unity. The, Paul talks a little bit about the dynamics of gospel unity. He gives a very interesting insight for, for if, you, if, you're part of a church, if you're part of this church or another church today, hope you're part of this one or whichever one you're part of, if you are a Christian, here's a dynamic that Paul gives about Christian unity. Very interesting dynamic, I think. He says he says in verse, uh, here's the dynamic. He says, for God, who was at work in Peter. Okay, we're, okay, here it is, here it is. Verse seven, here's the dynamic. They recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the uncircumcised. Here's the dynamics of Christian unity. One gospel, different callings, Right? One gospel message, different mediums for the message. What's happening here? Just think about this for a minute. Um, There's one gospel, but the goal's the same, and we go about the gospel and living the gospel maybe in different ways and working in different ways. Now, here's the dynamic that Paul was struggling with in Galatian, the Galatian churches and in Jerusalem, all across, simplified down to two kind of directions. The first thing is that sometimes we can find ourselves over adapting the gospel to our context, right? We can find ourselves over adapting the gospel to our context. That is, well, the gospel may be too hard for people to hear, maybe too hard to live. It might be too difficult. So what we see in our time and age is we see uh, people maybe saying, well, those miracles that Jesus did, maybe they were not really miracles, Maybe that a bodily resurrection of Jesus was not really a resurrection, it was just something. Maybe that hard edge of Christian ethics where, you know, my Christian life is a battle because I I, I can't live on my own every day the way I know I'm supposed to live and want to live. It's it's that battle of Christian. And all of that, when you let go and over-adapt the gospel, you lose Christian unity because you lose, you drift what might be called by many theologians, you drift into liberalism. On the other side of this dynamic of Christian unity, and stay with me on this, I hope this is not too detailed, but stay with me here, you might under-adapt the gospel, right? And, and this is maybe really the core of what Paul's going through here. Uh, you might, and in the Galatian church, this was the debate, right? Do Gentiles who weren't born Jewish have to adapt to Jewish customs and laws, or, or don't they? And so we might sometimes under-adapt the gospel and lose Christian unity that way. What does it mean, under-adapting the gospel? Under-adapting the gospel to a context in in whatever age you're living in, and Christians have had to work with this in every age, under-adapting the gospel means you're raising tradition to a place of non-negotiation, right? That the traditions I have uh, are become a system 
of kind of salvation unto themselves, and you can list different things in the modern church today, whether it be music, whether it be organizational structure, whatever the thing may be, if you under-adapt, you end up saying, well, all of these things over here are the things that actually matter, and if you, do, and you fall into legalism because what you say is real Christians do this and don't do that, all these tradition things, based on the level of tradition, not gospel as the apostles teach us. So if you find your own self saying, oh, that person over there is not a real Christian because they wear sandals to church like I am, then you know that that particular person is struggling in their own discipleship with under-adapting the gospel. And uh, that's something that God will work in their hearts and times, in your heart and in your times. So Christian unity, that dynamic was this, gospel message, lifestyle implications, all preserved but adapt the medium of the message for every time and every place. And we see here this gospel unity comes, uh, this outcome is beautifully said. Uh, they receive the right hand of fellowship when they recognize the grace given to me, Paul says. Um, I was at a church once, and, and I'm new actually to, to, to this part of churches, um, and uh, I grew up in another, another denomination uh, called the Presbyterians. But I went to be a guest preacher one time, and in that tradition at that church, um, the elders, before you preach, put their hand out, and they give you the right hand of fellowship before you come onto the pulpit. And it was my very first time in front of this fairly big church, and uh, I didn't know about this tradition, and, and I just sat in there, and I just walked right up there to the pulpit, and the guy was left <laughs> going like this, and I ghosted that church leader, and I still feel very guilty about that. Um, but that's an image, isn't it, of Christian unity, the, the handshake, the unity. And, and, and freedom that Paul's just talked about, and community, freedom and community, are two of these great yearnings of the human heart, right? And the outcome of Christian unity, the beautiful outcome of the Christian unity, as long as it's not through mushy feelings, cozy feelings and mushy thinking, is real community and is real freedom. And, and that's meant to be a desire for us as Christians, real Christian unity that, that leads to community, that leads to, in a way, all of us giving each other the right hand of fellowship, um, right, by thanking God for the grace at work in his life. I, I, I don't know where this came from, but I saw it somewhere and I wrote it down in my notes and I just love this little phrase. It might have been some of this Christian t-shirts and this Christian paraphernalia you can buy these days. But it was on somebody's something or other and I wrote it down a little while ago and it was like their motto. I think it might have been on their social media, I'm not sure. Basically their motto was this, make heaven crowded. Make heaven crowded. Oh, I love that little phrase, make heaven crowded. Are our hearts hearts for heaven being crowded? Are our hearts longing for unity, one with another? Uh, in this church, churches out some Christians in Hamilton. Uh, I'm so blessed to be part of the Steel Town Pastors Fellowship where pastors from different places all meet once a month and pray and share food together. And man, it's 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 the same Jesus and it's the same gospel. And I'm so encouraged. Are you drawn in your own life to make heaven crowded? Or are you stuck in a situation of over-adapting the gospel? You've let go of the hard things because they're too hard. Or under-adapting the gospel. I, 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 others, I have it right. Others don't because the sandals don't work. Sorry. Uh, then, then, then maybe God is calling you. Is God calling you to work on to Christian Unity, the joy of community. So we're almost done. Gospel vision, gospel freedom, gospel unity. And finally, very quickly, maybe this should be the longest section, I don't know. Gospel living, gospel living. Okay, very quickly. Gospel living at the very end, verse 10. Gospel living, we learn from Paul, reaches the poor. Gospel living reaches the poor. They asked, all, all they asked us is that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I've been here to do all along. The gospel, friends, must reach the minority. The gospel of Christ must meet, reach the downtrodden. The gospel of Christ must reach the refugee. 
The gospel of Christ must reach the homeless. We know this from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, that God is not simply concerned with my eternal soul, but God is also very concerned with the life of the one he's given life to today, that person now. And James, we read about this, and and boys and girls, if you're here still, and thank you for paying attention, go to the right-hand side of your Bible, further almost towards the end, Look very quickly at James chapter 2 and verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can faith such as save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accomplished by action, is dead. Who wrote that? James. Who's in this passage named? James. (laughs) Interesting, eh? James, Galatians 2, 1 to 10, James, chapter 2, same person. Why is this? Paul talks about the weakness in Corinthians. It's not by might. It's not the noble of birth. But God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame the strong. Why is that? What's happening here? Helping the poor. The gospel reaches the poor. There's some theological point to be made here, I think, which is that if you have been poor or are poor or interacted with those who are disenfranchised by the world in any kind of a situation, what you notice is this. They are not clinging to the things of this world. There is an openness there uh, where they are, their minds are not clogged by what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes. There is, there's an openness to, to letting go, in a way, of all the things that you and I tend to to hold on to. Of course, we serve a Savior who became poor, who in a way let go and gave his own will to follow the will of his Father. A Savior whose the wisdom of God is seen in the foolishness of the cross. A Savior who was crucified for you, broken for you, nails through his hands for you, surrendered for you, has redeemed you. And no matter where you are on this gospel vision, if you hear a gospel vision is wide or small, if you're struggling with gospel freedom, I'm not really sure I've become gospel unity where you are, or your gospel living, which might feel so stagnated, hear this morning that Christ has died for you. The foolishness of God, the weakness of God, being uh, of, of us, the wisdom of God being seen in the crucified Savior. And as we finish, I'll just read from Isaiah chapter 53 about this Savior who gave his life for us. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. What a a Savior. What a gospel. What grace. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for this opportunity to walk together together in your word, by your spirit. Please make this far more than information or knowledge, which is important. But Father, in the ways that only you can, because you're our creator and maker, will you please change our hearts? Some of our hearts have been hardened because of experiences, because of other concerns, Some of our hearts have grown cold. Some of us are are wandering. Oh, God, will in a great tidal wave of your goodness, may you draw us back, and may we hear the call of the risen Savior saying, follow me. In Jesus' name, amen.